As I say, my name is Neve Bushnell. I'm the CMO here at Soapbox and Maro and Brenda will be doing most of the talking and demoing today. Um, welcome to our webinar, How Voice AI Powers Early Literacy. Um, this is one of our favorite webinars to do. We always get a lot of great questions and, um, and a lot of engagement. So we're really happy to be here with you all today. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about Soapbox just um, to start us off and giving a little bit of housekeeping information. And then I'm going to let my expert colleagues take over and, um, and take us on a journey into how we power early literacy with our voice engine. So Soapbox, if you don't know the company, Soapbox is um, HQ'd in Ireland. Um, we were founded in 2013 by Dr. Patricia Scanlon, um, a speech engineer and scientist, and we develop speech recognition for young children's voices. And we are specifically focused on the education pre-K to 12 market. So we have clients who use our voice technology to power voice enabled tools across loads of different use cases. Early literacy, obviously, we're talking about today. We also power oral reading fluency assessment. We power spelling apps. We power science and math apps. We power language learning. Um, we have Early Bird is the client of ours who um, uses our tool to power a dyslexia screener. Um, so we are very, very focused on and committed to the education market pre-K to 12 and young kids' voices are our speciality. Um, so we have clients all over the world. A lot of our clients are actually based in the US and you will know some of these names, companies like Scholastic, Imagine Learning, Learning Without Tears, um, McGraw-Hill, uh, Early Birds, who I mentioned earlier on. And we have to date powered over 80 million learning experiences for kids. So we have delivered back from our voice engine over 80 million individual pieces of feedback, either to a child directly or to a teacher dashboard. And my colleagues, again, are going to be diving, to this, diving into this in, in much more detail in a little while. But so, you know, we've been working on this for the last 10 years. And I think the thing to know mostly about Soapbox, the most important thing that makes us feel very proud is that we are an equity by design company and a privacy first company. So we are committed as our mission to treat every child's voice equally who uses our tool, who uses our, our, our voice engine. So regardless of accent, dialect, age, socioeconomic background, skill acquisition, um, you should, as a child, have the same experience regardless of how you talk or what you know or where you're from um, using our voice engine. So it treats every child's voice equally. And we work really, really, really hard to deliver on that every single day. Um, and we have been independently validated for mitigating racial bias. In fact, we are the first AI company in the world to have been er to earn the certification from Digital Promise and the EdTech Equity Project for mitigating racial bias in AI design. And it's something that the people in our company talk about every day. We are super proud of this. And, uh, and bias is something that we continue to work on on a daily basis. You don't just deliver uh, an, an equitable product and then package it up and send it off. It's something that needs to be worked on and that we work on every single day. Uh, and, and my colleagues here in particular are very, very focused on it. So that's our equity story um, and our privacy story. We, we Since 2013, when we started, we have been a privacy by design company. So every process, everything we do is built around privacy. So the way that we handle uh, children's data so we, we take no um, personally identifiable information. All of the information, all of the data that comes to our voice engine is uh, anonymized and de-identified. And we are obviously COPPA and GDPR compliant. And we are um, certified on a regular basis by Prevo, who are a, 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 a safeguard company in the US who have been working with us since we started back in 2013 because we wanted to build a privacy first engine from the very start, from when we, from when we started building. So that's a little bit about the company. Um, in terms of today, this uh, session will be an hour long. So we will finish at uh, 6 p.m. Irish time. That is, I guess, 1 p.m. in on the East Coast. And the rest of you can do the math as to how that works out for you guys. Um, we are going to be recording the session. It's, re it's recording right now. And we'll send out the recording to everybody afterwards. 
uh, we will be using the Q&A only for questions. So if you have questions, put them into the Q&A at any stage during the demo and discussion, uh, we won't be using the chat for questions. So we'll be looking at the questions in the Q&A and getting through as many of them as possible at the end of the session. Um, we will send you out a survey after this as well to ask you how we did, what you'd like to hear the next time we do a webinar, all of that good stuff. Um, and I think that's probably it. Um, yeah, the Q&A is the, is the important piece. So Brenda and Mara are going to dive in and uh, do a demo and a discussion all around how we power early literacy. And then we'll probably finish up around 15 minutes before the top of the hour and go to your questions and answer as many of them as we can. If we don't get to your question or if you have more questions, hello at soapboxlabs.com is the place to find us and we can get in touch with you. We can pick up the phone. We can have a chat about your use case. We can learn more, all of that. Um, as a follow-up to this webinar. So with all of that said, Brenda, I think I've done enough talking now for the day. I think I'll hand over to you to um, take us from here. Super, thanks so much, Neve. That was a great introduction there and a lovely overview of Soapbox. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, and absolutely delighted to be here and have you all here with us today. As Neve said, my name is Brenda and I'm Head of Education Product here with Soapbox Labs. I've been with Soapbox for a little over five years, but I've known the company since they started. I knew um, Patricia and the earlier crew and was so excited about the work they were doing that I came to work here. And I had a huge ambition when I came here. My absolute passion is literacy and access to literacy. On a personal level, there's a lot of dyslexia in my family. So I've seen the impact that, that can have long term on somebody's life and having working in a job where you can help teachers and help students in the area of literacy gets me out of bed every morning. So it's just amazing that I can sit here today and say that we power literacy from the very earliest stages, from the very first steps that a child takes on their literacy journey, where it starts to become formal in a school setting, right up to fluency levels and including prosody, et cetera. It's just such an exciting place to be now for us as an organization. But what we're gonna focus on today and what Mauro is going to walk us through is a particular feature that we have that supports teachers in the classroom who are doing instruction in the earliest stages of literacy. So those foundational stages, whether it, we call it phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, early literacy, we're going to see all of that now. It's very exciting. So right from when the child starts to learn the letter shapes, the names of those letters and the associated sounds through the manipulation phases and up to the early decodables. That's the area we're going to focus on today. So um, very excited and very um, happy to take questions at the end, as Neve said. So um, I'll hand over to Maro and let you get started, Maro. Thank you so much, Brenda. And uh, as Neve and Brenda said, my name is Mara Nicolau. I'm head of speech at Soapbox. And I've been working in speech technologies for most part of my career for the last 20 years. And uh, in recently, in more recent years, I've been really focusing on computer assisted language learning and always be my passion. So without further ado, I will start sharing my screen so we can kick off with the um, with the demo. And before starting and diving into the actual um, early literacy uh, use cases and tasks, I will give you probably uh, it's best for me to give you a little overview of the of the interface that we are going to use today be using today for the demo. So what you have in front of you is not the actual product that we uh, deliver, but it's a sort of user interface at the uh, showcase uh, that our engineer put together to, to show, to, to put in a, let's say, human readable format, uh, our uh, response, the response of our engine. What we normally do, and I'll show you in a minute, we normally take uh, audio from our clients we process the audio and we return a, a sort of response to them in an API-based format. So in the, in the center, in the top center here, you'll see what we call internally uh, a target. So what our off-the-shelf solution, the one we'll be focusing today, and Niamh said at the beginning, we'll be focusing on, on the shelf solution 
of our engine, we basically search the that the target is being said in the audio file. Over here on the left side, we have some preloaded examples that I'm going to play today for you. We have several of them. I'll start with the with the sentence and I'll play right away. And please let me know if you hear the sound. My first beat, he said, it it went in the window and I flowed it. So as, as you heard, the sample is very clear, but there was some background noise and we could handle uh, the, the engine can handle very well. Um, also, you might have noticed that um, I, when I pressed the button, uh, you almost immediately you got on the right side the response from the engine. Please keep in mind this is a live demo, so every time I'm pressing the button, I'm actually uploading the file to the servers. The server processes it and gives the response back. So you also have an idea how fast the response is from our servers, and it's almost immediate. What do we get back from the um, the engine is actually something that I will only show one time. It's the text file I was mentioning before, and this is the level of uh, details that we our engine returns. It's it's a it's called a JSON file. It's a text format. It's a text file and very easy to parse for any software developer. So our clients uh, process this one in order to get all the information, create their dashboard, their application, everything. And this is what we all the information that we have here, all the phone level details, start time and quality is what we use to create what you have in front of you here on the right side. So first of all, this, the engine returns an overall score that basically scores the entire target. My first B, he said. My then we also can have, sorry, we can also have the um, word level breakdown. So each word is being scored separately and you, you see, and within, each word, we also have a phonemic breakdown where each phoneme is being scored um, individually. On top of the score, we also have start time and end time. So you can, at each point in time, you can, uh, if you want, you can go back to the audio and play the bit of the audio that you're interested if you see something that requires some attention. Uh, before I move forward, I probably I have to mention what the score is. Score uh, is basically, it can be seen as a metric, as a, an assessment of how close the pronunciation that is, which is in the file is with respect to the uh, acoustic model that we have trained. So it's a similarity measure of the quality of the um, of the pronunciation. The highest, the score, the more similar it is to our pronunciation models. And another thing that probably is worth mentioning, I don't know if you spotted while I play the audio, but the child made a mistake down here. Load. So they, instead of saying follow, they say float. And as you can see, this the engine detected that something was missing in the in the file in the audio here and the phoneme is marked as very low score and very short duration that means the phoneme is missing load there, there is another way of course uh, i searched in the target i searched for the entire sentence i could have just searched for one word so the the way the system the off the shelf solution works is that we search for what's in the in the target in the audio let's say i wanted just to to search for one word in the entire audio my first b he said it load i won't play it uh, uh, it all but you might see that the system could detect among the inside the entire audio, just a bit load where the uh, the word was, and in a sort of keyword spotting fashion, and also detected the error. So this is our off the shelf how our off the shelf solution works. And okay, so now that we've 
kind of have an idea of the user interface that we have in front of you, that you have in front of you, we can move into the early literacy use cases, which are the interesting part of uh, this webinar. And I think so, it's worth mentioning there, um, before Mara goes into that, that one of the things that's really incredible about how the engine has been developed, this is an off-the-shelf solution that's designed to be extremely flexible. So it's designed in a way that whatever your use case, whatever your requirement is, you can design the target in such a way that you'll get exactly what you need back from the engine within that JSON response. And um, it really does make it, it's 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 not just highly accurate, it's incredibly flexible. So I think it's just worth mentioning that. Absolutely, uh, Brenda. And also it's worth mentioning that we are not prescriptive with this core. So let's say that our customers can choose the threshold on the score that they prefer, depending on the at which stage of the literacy journey uh, the, the students are, the children are. So they can be more strict with a higher threshold or more forgiving with a lower threshold. And we give full freedom to our clients to select that. Uh, here we have a sort of traffic lights uh, system, red, amber, and green, but it's just flexible and decided over here. We can, it can be changed and can be adapted to any customer's um, need. So um, the first use case we want, talk, uh, we want to talk about when it gets to early literacy is letter names. So uh, the child, the use case is that the child is asked to read and say the name of a letter on screen. For this particular use case, we use a specific markup uh, tag. Um, and this is the one in front of you letter. Um, this is because when it gets to a single letter, it's, we have to tell the engine what's the pronunciation for that. And with the markup in front of you, we say we want the letter name. So G, not G or J or something else. So the, the system and the engine is not confused. G. As you heard, the, the, the sample I played is very well produced. So on the response, the, the score is very G. high. And again, the same as before, we have the phonemic breakdown, G. phone level, G. and with start time, end time, and individual scores. Another very common use case that could be that you want to check that the child said G and not a similar sounding letter, for example, B, C, D. And in order to do so, we make use of, a, um, let's say, what we call multiple target. It's a way of using our off-the-shelf solution, off-the-shelf engine, that when one single request and multiple targets, different, let's say, uh, letters can be evaluated at the same time. And I'll show you. G. So the sample is the same as before, G. So we are searching for G. And you see that the highest score comes with G. G, G, G. So for similar sounding like B, C, D, you see that the first phoneme is marked as wrong or not there with, with a very low score. That means that it's very unlikely that this sound was pronounced. but this one is the one. G, G, G. So the E is there, but the, the first sound was missing. And we get this a lot, don't we, Mara, when we're working with uh, customers where Absolutely. they're con yeah, they're concerned that, well, there are common mistakes that children make, especially at this stage. They're little, they're learning. So there may be letters that they mix up like D and B, et cetera. And they're saying, well, you know, they sound very alike. So if the child says D instead of D, they're going to get a score, right? So part of um, part of how we've designed the engine is in thinking this through and saying, what's the child typically going to do? What responses might we expect? We don't just say, let's make sure that the engine has a, has a result that looks right. We work through use cases. We work through uh, case studies with customers and we think about what, what will a child do in this instance? And so if the child does say B instead of D or D instead of G, 
we can see that we can tell that the child has made that mistake. And that's that's incredibly valuable information to be able to deliver back to a teacher in a condensed way. Uh, uh, that's absolutely right. That's why we designed the system that way. Another use case that we normally uh, we we use when uh, or we highlight when we come to letter names is of course spelling. So the task here, the child is asked to say the to spell out the word take. T A K E. Again, on the, the response from the engine is very high quality. T you see, in this case, each word is actually a letter. Um, so we the word breakdown is actually the letter name breakdown. And again, we have the score, individual score at phoneme level. And uh, it's worth mentioning also that this, in this case, the order, because we put all the letters in one single target, the score, the overall score here, 93%, takes into account of the order. So the letter needs to be produced in the correct order. Um, then we, um, I'll show another example, show you another example of spelling. L-L-A-N-G-O-L-O. -L -L -O. So this time we have a little um, mispronunciation. There is an error on the letter R. L. Uh, or uh, the, the, the the engine flagged as a low similarity with our engine with our models, and so this is very powerful. Then the teacher can might go there and decide whether this uh, type of pronunciation requires attention. It's just a little off from the, the what the model expected, whilst the rest was flagged as correct. Um, this um, specific tar task where the, um, can be used, uh, this specific target design uh, can be also used for um, when the child is asked to read sequences of letters in a sort of dyslexia screening uh, use case. And because again, as I said before, we also score the order. We take into account of the order and the order is important here as part of the uh, of the scoring. Yeah, that's, that's a really good example, Maro. And then the other one, of course, is we know that teachers have the joy of having to benchmark children three times a year. So they might be going through, say, for example, Dibbles type activity or whatever program you happen to be use where the children, one of the activities the children have to do is read a sequence of letters in a particular order. And uh, it's a fantastically powerful way to be able to automate either the practice or the assessment itself and see to this very fine detail how well a whole group of children are doing. And if there's a particular group or um, child in the classroom who needs intervention from that teacher. So they are able to translate data into information that enables teachers to make decisions. So um, right down to the to the level of that. Uh, um, the pronunciation of a letter or the order of a sequence of letters. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we just gave, uh, gave you an overview of the letter name use case. Of course, the following uh, very typical use case in terms of uh, early literacy journey is the letter sound. So the child in this use case is asked to produce uh, uh, the sound of one letter. And for this particular target, we designed this particular target in a slightly different way as be, uh, from before. We use a markup called SoundOut, and we also need to provide the pronunciation here. Uh, the reason we need to provide pronunciation is because again, G, uh, th this letter here can be sound can sound in different way depending on the context. So we have to tell the engine which sound we are looking for. And in this case, we are looking for the hard G sound, G. Um, the, um, the way we address the phonemic pronunciation or the pronunciation is through alphabet coding. And we have documentation to help you design in this part. So I'll play this sample. G. Again, it's a very good sample. So the response came back very high G. score. And the, phon the phoneme is just one this time, of course, is just 
we are looking just for phonemes. Um, but the, and the response style is very, very similar to what we've seen so far. The uh, natural, let's say, evolution of that would be the decoding or the sounding out of a word. And we use the same markup here, sound out, without pronunciation, because we take the canonical pronunciation from our internal dictionary of the word take. So the, the use case here is the children, the child is asked to say the word take let sound by sound. I'll play the sample. A. Again, because the um, the word is a very common word, we can take the pronunciation from the dictionary, the, and the, we take the canonical pronunciation. It. A. And you, as you can see in front of you here, but if you were looking from uh, for a specific pronunciation or a very specific, different, let's say. Uh, way of um, saying you can always specify the pronunciation attribute here and give the pronunciation you're looking for. Why we need uh, the sound out markup instead of just using, for example, the word take? Um, I'll show you in a minute. A. So as you could see, I made use again of the multiple target feature of our off the shelf solution. And so we are scoring two targets at the same time. And one is sound out, which is meant to have silence in between the sounds. So in between the phonemes, you, you need uh, a little bit of silence or, or a little pause. And this one instead, is the blended version of the same um, word. And as you can see, was scored very poorly. And that means that the child said the first one, the sounded out version, not the blended one. And this is something that when you assess the ability of the child to sound out the code, it's a very, uh, it's something that te uh, teacher are interested in uh, being sure of, they, they, they didn't do. Isn't that right, Brenda? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, essentially, as I said earlier, we don't start with the tech, we start with the use cases. We start with what do teachers need to know, what do educators need, and how might a child respond in this case? So depending on the instructional model a child has received, if you say to a child, tell me all the sounds in the word take, the child might say take, and then send it out, or they might just send it out straight away, or they might just go take. You know, so we need to be able to accommodate all of those different kinds of responses and be able to deliver that information back or to support our partners to do that, really, I should say, because we don't we don't build the, the user facing product. So regardless of how a child has been told to blend or decode or break down or sound out or segment, we need to be able to consider all of that. And we have the design, we've designed the engine in such a way that it doesn't matter how the child has been instructed. What we care about is what does the teacher need to know? The teacher needs to know that Brenda just repeated the word and didn't send it out, but Marrow did both. Marrow said, take, and then he sent it out. So the teacher knows Marrow knew what to do, but Brenda didn't. And so, in a, in a really nicely designed interface for a teacher, they may get a group of four kids who say, you know, these four children, they just said the word, they didn't actually send it out. Okay, you know, I need to, I need to check on those four children. So it really does create those actionable insights for, for teachers to be able to go over it again, or in a more automatic kind of interface where, you know, you can deliver feedback straight to the child and say, yeah, great, that's the word take. Now let's try again. Tell me all the sounds, and you can you can support the child with um, supportive feedback and instruction, where you give them a modeled example, let them try again, and then move on again. So there are so many ways that they, this can be used to really empower learners and their educators to to deliver this kind of learning at such a foundational level. I'll stop now, Mara, you can go on. No, that's absolutely great, actually. And, and it's exactly what we are designing our system for. Um, but, uh, so moving to the next use case that we, uh, let's, let's say the natural evolution of the early literacy journey is 
uh, the blending uh, of sounds. So we ask the children to uh, re say the letter name, then we ask the chil uh, children to say the letter sounds, and then we, in the next step, we start ask the, the child to uh, blend sounds together in a format such as phonics and or letter with multiple sounds such as x yeah so now the the letter is mapped in two sounds it's not just a single phoneme there is no silence in between for that reason we need a specific markup a new one called custom word that custom word uh, markup is very very powerful he um, can address so many different use cases. And one of them is the phonic. And I have another probably easier example to, um, to see. Quoi? In this one, for example, and again, the response is Quoi? similar to what we've seen before. So we're, um, target level score and then uh, phonemic breakdown. But the, the important thing is that with custom work, we can map any sequence of letter into a sequence of sound. So we can, with this custom word and the pronunciation uh, attribute, we can address any type of pronunciation and make it up live as we, as we see. So uh, you can address phonics, you can address syllables, part of words, or even nonsense words, or words that are not yet in our dictionary. Um, for example, uh, a fictional character such as Fonzi here. So for example, this one has a completely um, new pronunciation. Um, so it cannot be uh, taken by from the uh, dictionary. And- Fonzi. We can pass this target with the markup, custom word markup. We can map this sequence of letter into the sequence of phonemes, and the, this would be score. Let's say that if we didn't search for Fonzi, but we search for Fonzi. Fonzi, Fonzi. You can see that the system could flag that the child said the Z sound, not the Z, the S sound. And I think this, uh, when we introduced this, customer were very, very happy because that allowed them to really be as flexible as they wanted in the design of their, um, of their targets. Also, again, making use of the um, multiple target feature, you can search for the correct pronunciation against a wrong pronunciation, a very common mistake. And that's, Fonzie. you see the high, high uh, score goes to the correct pronunciation and Fonzie. the low score goes to the uh, pronunciation with an error and the phoneme, which was missing or mispronounced actually is being flagged as, and also can be highlighted. Again, this is a very, very powerful uh, tool that allows a lot of customization for the customer. This uh, type, of, um, so complete um, freedom in designing the targets, but also in designing possible uh, errors or more uh, very common mistakes. Yeah. Um, we yeah, had some really good. Oh, sorry, Mara. <laughs> we had um, some really good conversations recently with the customer where they were um, so designing two scope and sequence in terms of um, phonological awareness, and um, the discussion was around the short O and the long O, and which one the ch the children were learning at that particular stage, and checking that the, the children had grasped within a word which version of that to use, et cetera. So it was a really nice example of how you can check for the correct version or pronunciation of a, sing a single set of sounds within context of, of words, et cetera. So checking if the, the kids have learned that bit before you move on. And, you know, we had a piece of, of feedback there um, 
several months ago, which was just wonderful from a teacher who said, this is a game changer. I now know out of the whole class of 30 kids, which ones are ready to move on and which ones struggled a tiny bit because teachers know their classrooms. They know the kids who are going to struggle. They know the kids who are flying ahead of the others. But when there's that group in the middle, just being able to catch something small as it happens and being able to intervene on the spot, move it along means that, you know, they don't find out months later that, oh, you know, Brenda didn't quite get that a while ago and going to have to go over that again but being able to do that and I just thought that was a great way to put it that it was a game changer for this particular teacher so I thought that was great and um, the example that we were talking through was where the child was practicing in homework which the teacher has if it's oral homework the teacher doesn't know unless they have a system where they can listen back or it flags to listen back because Neve struggled with something this week so that was a really nice example that we had recently. Yeah, it's very nice when you hear the feedback from teachers and customers that they are happy with the, with, with the solution that we design. And uh, before probably uh, I'll stop the demo, uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning that the uh, uh, scoring very short sounds is very, very uh, difficult target because uh, first of all, the amount of speech that we are evaluating is very short so it's like you picking up the phone and someone is saying just one uh, sound and you have to guess which one it is so that's what this the, the engine is doing so without any context without any further information the, the engine has to decide which sound was produced and as we all know some sounds are very similar to each other that's why is so powerful to have uh, to use multiple targets so you can contrast one the the expected target against some other targets that yeah we internally call negative targets but uh, or some very common mistakes so um the, in when we score short sounds there is very little context very little uh, there are no nearing phones so it's uh, th there is no help from the nearing phones and the some of the sounds also uh, are fully realized only when in, in the in the nearing uh, phonemes or sounds so that's why this challenge was really hard and we are very happy we can we, we could deliver it and said this i think i can stop sharing my screen and i think i'll um Top with the demo and I think Super. we are ready to take the questions thanks so much for that Mara that was really great um and you know there's only so much you can get across in 20 minutes half an hour of demo demoing um how how the engine works because we don't build a user interface to uh, to put in front of a, an educator or a, a student um or a child who's learning in a more informal way through a, a play app or whatever um it, it can be hard to demonstrate, but I just think that's that's incredibly powerful. And, you know, just to recap what we saw there was how the engine can do letter names, how it can differentiate between a letter name and a letter sound, how it can differentiate between things that are so close like B, D, G, you know, which it's really hard to do, but it can differentiate at that level. It can look at isolation, phoneme isolation, it can do segmentation, it can do blending when a child is blending out and sending out a word and then when they're decoding so where a child might be decoding a word into its individual sounds and then saying the word and right up then also to um, those early decodables where a child is reading say well, there's no limit on it, but where a child is reading, you know, three to five words in a sentence because this is what they've just learned recently. So it, it takes it right from those very single sounds all the way up to words and words in a sentence. Um, and it's out of the box and it's incredibly powerful. So um, it's just I get excited every time I see it and we worked on it. So, uh, And of course, we just touched the early literacy, of course, use yeah. cases, but there are many more like multiple choices. If you have a question and you want to check multiple choices in a, a voice power exercise with multiple yeah. choices, then you can use multiple target for choices and you pick the one with the highest score or yeah, so many use cases that apart from the early literacy one. And, and uh, again, to not to, sorry, Brenda, yeah. 
uh, again, I would uh, highlight that this type of um, um, off-the-shelf solution and engine doesn't need any customization. So the moment you get access to the engine, you can start using right away and de developing your own app, receiving the JSON file you've seen immediately, and then you can process and display. And that's that's very powerful. And it's, it's so forgiving of not just how children speak, but how they behave. You know, if you ask them a question, you know, what color was the ball? You're going to get red. You're going to get the ball was red. You're going to get a red ball. You know, you're going to get so many different responses from an individual child. And this the, the way this particular engine works, it's so flexible. If you just want to know, did the child say red? You could do that. Do you want to know that the child said more words than that? Are they being fluent? Are they using function words together? You can do that. It's incredibly flexible. And as we mentioned earlier, we do also accommodate fluency, uh, um, comprehension, retail, uh, and prosody measures all the way up to that. But what we've been focusing on today are our foundational literacy um, measures, which are just so, so important and have been so much talked about um, in the last few years with um, with with everything that's going on. So uh, we're very, very proud of it. Um, I think, Neve, is there anything that we haven't covered that you think we may have missed? Well, we have loads of questions as usual. Great. Maybe Super. we'll dive into some of those and those can take us in a couple of other directions. Um, I'm gonna start with the, 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 the one that's in front of me here, talking about the audio and, you know, what do you do with, can the engine react to audio that's less clean? So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that marrow and background noise and how we've built it too. Absolutely. So uh, we built our engine to be uh, robust enough to um, commonly say noises. Probably you remember at the beginning, I played an example and there was some background, there was some background noise, some like there were uh, probably a bicycle or someone playing the playground behind the person speaking so uh and as you could see the engine was super robust uh well that the way we um we do it is basically we expose we train our acoustic model uh, with a lot of different type of noises and a lot of variations in the in the um the type of audio that we process and that makes our system robust to most common type of noises. Of course, uh, there is a limit. I'm not going to lie. The, and the rule of thumb here, here is that if a human person can transcribe it, can understand what's going on, our engine is very likely to, to do it. <laughs> Actually, Brenda, I can tell you stories that recently we uh, were surprised by how good our engine is, probably better than human, at picking up things that are either very low volume or some yeah background noise that uh, it, a very common use case is that the child is recorded in a classroom where other children are speaking at the same time and the engine could pick up the the actual person that was speaking rather than the background noise we were quite yeah so yeah amazed by that well it, it's something we worry about all the time because we know that kids are in busy environments whether they're at home or in the classroom and the teacher might be doing a whole class instruction followed by group instruction and you know the you know our engine may be used in this in a situation where there's a group of children practicing together but there's something else going on in the classroom at the same time or there's a group of children being assessed at the same time so you know we're constantly checking we're constantly looking at these use cases and ensuring that the engine performs to ensure that that child using our engine has the best possible outcome when they're using our technology. So it's a, it's a big deal for us, but yeah, we're constantly relieved when we check. <laughs> yeah. um, Brenda, there's a question here. Can this program replace Dibble? So I'm gonna ask you to, 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 to clarify the difference there, um, yeah. but maybe at, at, at the top, just to remind people. So we are the voice AI, we are the, the voice engine in the background. So we do not develop front-end products that teachers or young students use. We're the, we're the, we're the Intel inside, we're the, the, the power behind the product. But Brenda, can you explain how yeah. we work with Dibbles? Maybe that might be helpful. 
Absolutely. So as everybody here knows, and I know we've loads of educators and loads of people who work in education on the call, um, Dibbles is a very particular program that's used to assess children. And often it's administered three times a year to benchmark how the child is doing. It's great. It's grade leveled. It's beginning of year, middle of year, end of year. We also have customers we work with who have programs that wouldn't be dissimilar to Dibbles, but would have their own particular IP behind them and that would be used in similar ways. So what we can do is we can work with programs like that. So what we would hope that would happen is that pain of a teacher having to sit with 30 children in a busy classroom setting at where they have to sit with each child and go through quite, quite robust observed, observed um, assessment becomes automated. So the, the, the teacher then only has to intervene with the child who maybe is really struggling with the assessment, but they can see how the children are doing overall. So Dibbles has single letters, single names. It has um, sequences of letter sounds. It has um, high frequency words. It has uh, quite complex, it goes right up to quite complex passages from quite short passages to quite complex passages. And those uh, letter names and sounds start to dip out as the child goes up through the grades. So what we've seen here today would, would mirror a, in a lot of ways the content of Dibbles, but we do not develop content. We are not pedagogical experts. We rely on our partners to be the experts to deliver the, the, the pedagogy that we can trust that is going to be able to either instruct or assess a child's ability um, at that particular level. But we, the answer is we can work with anything that's in Dibbles or in a similar program. I hope that's that's clear. That's great, Brenda, thank you. Um, Mara, this one is solidly for you. Um, I'm going to read it out. You can probably see it yourself. Single consonant phonics can be difficult to pronounce in isolation. And so a bit of vowel sound is often added as well as in one of your examples, we heard G approximately as jur. How does the system handle this? E.g. a completely unvoiced P just as puff of air versus a P. Okay, uh, yeah, as I said uh, uh, earlier on, uh, the single sound is a very difficult task and the uh, because of the lack of context. And as has been rightly said by, by the person who asked the question, the sometimes the, the, the consonant is better realized in the following uh, vowel or in the following sound. And the way the system works is, so the two ways we, we address this problem. Of course, uh, the, the system can detect just the portion which is the consonant and basically discard the part that's the, 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 the voice part the vowel uh, afterwards and the uh, also another way to discriminate and be sure that the, the desired sound the target was produced is using again multiple targets and be sure that this is not confused with something else so the the target you're looking for is the one with the highest one and all the other common mistakes or possible confusions, they score lower. So that's how we are sure that we detect. Uh, it's probably worth to mention that we don't design application, but we have a lot of experience supporting uh, customers with, um, in designing this kind of target. So we uh, put together some, I think, very comprehensive guidelines that help uh, customers in designing this target is specifically for very tricky use cases such as consonant plosives and, and unvoiced plosives. So for, for that reason, we can support our customers, our clients in uh, at every step of their designing process and, and help in also finding the best solution for that specific use cases. Great. I hope that answered your question. And if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to us, and I will can probably there is not enough time to go all every uh, through every single use case. But yeah, we are very happy to to discuss further. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello at soapboxlabs.com is the place to start if you want to jump on a call with us or talk to us about your specific use case.
Um, Mara, another one for you it was the first question that came in actually. Um, in the example shared by Mara, the child repeated a couple of words. Is that reflected in the score? So it sounds that sounds a bit like a, a soapbox fluency type question. Do, do you or, or even Brenda, do you guys want to jump in and talk about that a little bit? Okay, so uh, I, I can start saying, so if there is a repetition, um, as I said, the, the way the um, off-the-shelf solution works is uh, by, as in a sort of keyword spotting. So it searches for the audio uh, for, the, uh, from, for the target, which is specified in the target field. And, and it just searches for that one. If there is a repetition and is not in the target, if the target has two repetitions, then we search for both. If the there is no repetition in the target, the target will highlight the one which has, a, let's say, better pronunciation, let's put it this way, or a bad, better similarity with the model. If uh, you were interested in repetitions, insertions, and substitution, we do have another solution which um, can help, and it's a customized a bespoken solution that requires some customization for each customer. And that's the, the use case that targets that solution is the reading assessment. So the, the normal use case, a child is asked to read a passage, could be short, could be very long. And the, the system recognizes what the child said, and it uh, compares the, the recognition with the original passage prompt and computes the differences. So if there were repetitions, insertions of, of the, uh, the prompt solution, uh, sorry, words, the, all these were, will be highlighted. But um, yeah, that can be also very powerful and returns a so short summary of the errors that have been made in, in the reading um, exercise. I think the the first question we always ask if we're, if we're um, working with a customer is, what do you need to know? Not what can the engine do, but what do you need to know? What does the teacher need right now? Why is this assessment happening? Because sometimes it's quite a binary thing. Was the child able to pronounce that word? Was the child able to say that, that it, what sound is associated with that letter, et cetera? Sometimes it's more complex. We're looking for common mistakes. And then sometimes it's a fluency assessment, such as Mara just identified there, where we're looking for those common reading errors. We're looking for disfluencies. We're looking for insertions, omissions, deletions. Um, sorry, I've already said that. Um, substitutions self-corrections, repetitions, pauses, hesitations. So th there's a different part of the engine that works with that. So we always start with, what do you need to do? What does the teacher need to know? And we will help you to, th the engine can do all of that. I know it sounds a bit trite saying we can do anything, but in fact, depending on how you use the engine, you can, which is yeah. great. Um. I don't understand this question, but maybe you guys do from Naresh. Um, what is the impact of transformers in the speech application? Maro, do you, is that one for you? Yep. Uh, okay. So transformers is basically the state of the art of speech recognition. Uh, these days, everybody's talking about transformers as a type of neural network or type of uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. Um, of course, we cannot go into the details of what, uh, how we train our system, but uh, let's say and be assured that we are using state-of-the-art systems in, in our engine and modeling our sounds. Great. So, that sounds like something that you could dive into a, a, a long one-on-one um, -on -one conversation about if that person. I mean, yeah, these days, uh, everybody yeah. talk about transformers. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Great. Um, we have a question about um, the common types of partnerships that Soapbox engages and how they're structured and the cost. So I, I'll just quickly answer that one again. It's down to the individual. We typically sign strategic partnerships with our clients because a lot of our clients are large education companies who have solutions across the whole range of pre-K to 12. And they don't just have solutions for main or core, you know, mainstream, they have supplemental solutions and they have solutions that are for reading and some for language learning and some for math and some for science. And so we usually do strategic partnerships with larger companies, multi-year, multi-product, where we come in as the infrastructure, the voice infrastructure layer. And we, you know, we put together a bespoke solution for them. And um, we also uh, have Soapbox Studio, which is 
kind of our consulting arm when people come on board with us and uh, have a license with us, we can help them with the expertise we have around UX and technology and data to get up and running. So that's another piece of the offering that we bring in for clients, large and small. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a paid service that when clients are looking to really get help to accelerate their delivery to the market, the success of the product in the market, Soapbox Studio is a team internally who can help them to do that. But it really depends. A lot of strategic partnerships. And then with younger companies, with start startups we do a lot of you know they have an app they get access to the to the api and they plug in and off they go and you know we <laughs> we um we work with them as they develop and as they scale um and it's then it's a volume based and um, it can be a volume based or a transaction based um situation but we're we're quite flexible with that so get in touch with us if you're uh, if you're interested in telling us more about your specific use case and how we could work with you um let's see is there one fine we've got three minutes left so um, Brenda, was there anything that you wanted to 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 kind of conclude with there on 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 the back? There's a couple of questions here, but they're all stuff that we can we wouldn't be able to um to to dive into in too much detail because there's so little time left. I think um, the only thing to mention, and I'm just shocked that the question hasn't come up. So we're the two things we are always asked is accents and dialects and noise, <laughs> and because it's a, it's a concern. OK, and, and I think you, you covered it off beautifully at the beginning um, where you talked about us being an equity first company. Um, our data comes from hundreds of countries across the, of course, the globe. And, you know, in particular, you might say, well, I'm in North America, but, you know, I have kids who um, have a particular accent on the East Coast, another on the West Coast, another in the North, another in the Northeast. We know that and we are are one of our driving um mantras is we want to meet the child where they are regardless of their age regardless of their gender regardless of their um their dialect we we want to be able to cope with that child no matter what their their requirement is so our models have been changed on trained on such a vast array of um, data that when uh, Mara was speaking earlier about how well does it match our model well you know we we have models of most children speaking in their their own way and in the, with their own accent etc so don't be fooled by the fact that the um the demo is quite compact because it's 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 there to be used in, in the space of 15 minutes and then the other one is um is is noise in the background i think we covered that earlier you know it, it will cope with noise to a certain level a reasonable level and after that it's like guys even i couldn't figure out what the child was saying with all that noise going on so i think they're just two of the biggest ones we tend to get super yeah. um robert a quick answer to your question yes um we can be integrated to uh into a into a program like that to be a to, to support a, a situation of, of kids learning with a with a one-on-one -on -one tutor we have some clients in that area um i think that's it we have a minute to go so i think i'll just thank everybody for joining us we had a great audience today and thank you everybody for sharing where you're coming from and a bit about your backgrounds in the chat it was really lovely to read all of that and especially to my colleagues to Maro and brenda Thank you for delivering a wonderful webinar and demo and um, get in touch with us. Hello at soapboxlabs.com if you want to know anything more or if you want us to talk to you specifically about your use case and what you'd like to do to voice enable your experience for kids uh, in education. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.